In today's video, I'm going to switch from Mac OS to this, the Google Pixelbook. And we're gonna see if I can make the switch and also if the Pixelbook is any good. Now before I get started, this video is not sponsored by Google. They sent me the Google Pixel Book to review, but they are not paying me for this review at all. I am not beholden to them in any way. This video is, however, sponsored by CyberGhost VPN. With CyberGhost, you can encrypt your entire digital life, hide your IP address, and secure your bank transactions, even on unsecured public Wi-Fi networks. CyberGhost keeps no logs, and one subscription covers up to seven devices with apps available across platforms and for different operating systems. Head on down to the link in the description below to get CyberGhost for just $2.75 per month. I've been using Macs literally my entire life. The first family computer that my family owned when I was a kid was the original Mac Mini in 2005. Then in 2008, we got a refurbished 2007 iMac that we used for about five or six years. And I personally bought my first Apple laptop in 2012 when I bought a refurbished 13-inch MacBook Pro from late 2011. And obviously, I've had quite a few Macs since then. I also used PCs. My first laptop was a 2006 Toshiba Satellite A100 that I found discarded on the curb that I used for quite a few years, actually, given that that thing was so slow it could barely even run Windows XP. However, I've never really given Chrome OS much thought, but today that's going to change. Google sent me this Pixelbook. It's been out for a while now, but it's still a very interesting device. This is what I would consider a premium Chromebook, as its starting MSRP of $1,000 would imply. The model that Google sent me is actually the top config. It comes with the KB-like Core i7, 16 gigs of RAM, and a 512 gigabyte solid state drive. The MSRP for this machine is $1,650. That's no laughing matter for a Chromebook. Size-wise, this is an odd device. The footprint is similar to a 13-inch MacBook Pro. It's a little bit narrower and a little bit taller and a little bit thinner. However, if we look at the display and the specifications, this lines up more with the 12-inch Retina MacBook or other premium Ultrabooks such as the Razer Blade Stealth. Price-wise, it's roughly comparable to the 12-inch MacBook insofar as it uses similar low-wattage fanless processors. When we compare the two, the Chromebook is actually less expensive for each spec. A MacBook with an i7, 16 gigs of RAM, and 512 gigabyte SSD costs $1,949, exactly 300 bucks more than the Pixelbook. Spec for spec, this is an interesting comparison because the Pixelbook would offer on paper better value for the performance that you're getting. But in practice, it gets a little bit more complicated because you can definitely justify spending $2,000 on a premium Windows or Mac Ultrabook with a full operating system. However, for something that runs Chrome OS, I'm not sure if it's worth it. Even in its base configuration, isn't this thing just a little bit overkill for Chrome OS? My challenge is this. I'm going to use the Google Pixelbook for a full week as my daily driver laptop. So we're gonna find out if I can overcome the limitations of Chrome OS and find out if this machine is a good value. Okie dokie, so day one, first impressions of the Google Pixelbook. I've got a few interesting thoughts on this device. The first one is, the Switch and ecosystem. So obviously I'm coming from a Mac. That is what I use primarily for all of my work and I have my file system pretty much integrated into Mac OS. I use pages for typing and I store my documents in iCloud Drive. I also use Apple's calendar app and that sort of thing. So everything is kind of synced into Mac OS, which makes the switch over to using Google Drive a little bit tricky. Of course they have to be doing construction right now. Now I say this knowing that for a lot of people, this switch is meaningless. A lot of people use Google Drive anyway, so they don't really care about that switch in ecosystem. Okay, so now I wanna talk a little bit about the device itself, because I've noticed some things that I like and some things that I don't like. The first is in the design, 
This is a very tall aspect ratio screen, which is great for browsing web content, but it's a little bit narrow for my tastes. I like 16 by 10, I think that's the best sweet spot for widescreen versus extra height for reading. This one's a little bit narrow for my tastes, but it's not awful. Now, the physical design of this device is very good. One of the things you'll notice is that it is perfectly flat. There's no tapering on the top or bottom. It is a flat top, flat side device. If you have this thing closed, the side profile is exactly the same as if you go into tablet mode. You can see right there, the profile is exactly the same. A lot of two-in-ones have some amount of tapering on the outside to make it look a little more seamless when it's closed. But what that means is when you put it in tablet mode, you get like a weird gap between the screen and the keyboard. This thing doesn't have that at all. It looks exactly the same whether it's in tablet or not. And as such, it feels like a pretty normal tablet when you're using it in tablet mode. Except for, of course, the fact that you're holding it by the keyboard and the trackpad. This is something that I don't like about all two-in-ones. I think this is just really dumb when you get down to it. Holding it by the keyboard and trackpad, I mean, I get that they don't do anything and they're deactivated, but it's weird. So the other downside to the two-in-one-ness of this device is the speakers. In a laptop mode, the speakers are not great. They come out of the keyboard. They don't sound very good, but they're, you know, they're passable for watching YouTube videos occasionally. However, because they fire out of the speaker, if I wanted to put this thing in like a stand mode like this and watch a YouTube video, all of a sudden my speakers are firing into the table. It sounds unbelievably terrible. And the same when you use it in tablet mode, because if you're holding it like this in tablet mode watching something, the sound's coming out over here. It's a horrible experience. Let's run through some of the benchmarks. In Geekbench 4, the 2011 had a multi-core score of 9,000. Some of the much more expensive Retina MacBook Pros, even as recently as 2016. And this is a $1,000 starting device. That is kind of unacceptable in my book. Now, actually, really quick about that starting price. Let me just look up Pixelbook on Amazon, because this thing has been out for a little while. Yeah, and sure enough, it's on sale. You can get this thing for $919 from Google themselves. So that's a decent discount, but keep in mind that's with 8 gigs of RAM, 128 gigabyte SSD, and a Core i5. That is still a lot of money for a device that ultimately just runs Chrome OS. Okie dokie, so it's day four right now of using the Pixelbook, and I finally started to say Pixelbook properly. I kept wanting to say Chromebook Pixel, but that's the old one. I have two very frustrating things to report about this specific device. The first one is, you know how sometimes when you're like frustrated with your computer, it's like on your lap, right? And it's like being slow or the internet's not working or something and you kind of get frustrated and you kind of just smack the palm rest. Not very hard, not like, attacking it or anything. There's no way I'm the only one that does that. I'm sure everyone else has slapped their palm rest out of frustration. So anyway, I was using the computer on my lap and it, the internet was being slow and I just slapped it a little bit on the palm rest. And then I noticed this. The device bent just from that. That's all it took. It was just a tiny little slap. Actually, you know what? As a matter of fact, why don't we go ahead and just try it? So you're using your computer. The internet's being annoying. You just kind of smack it a little bit out of frustration. See, that wasn't very hard, barely did anything. Let's go ahead and close it and see what happens. As you can see, yeah, it bent. It's pretty significant. This side is closed, this side is not. And you guys saw it, that was not a very hard hit. Now the benefit is you can bend it back pretty easily. See, I'll just kind of flex it a little bit with my hand. And then when I close it, yeah, that's, that's got it fixed. Isn't that a little bit alarming though? I don't know, that doesn't really instill a lot of hope in terms of like long-term durability. Okay, so structural issues aside, the other thing that really annoys me about this device is the way that it handles the automatic uh, brightness and keyboard backlight controls. So by default, when you turn the machine on, it's going to adjust automatically. Both of those are going to be automatic. 
you've got these two buttons here that control brightness. So I figured surely the way to control the keyboard brightness because there's no dedicated button would be to press alt and then do the brightness controls. Not true though. By default, the alt key is bound to bring up the application tray. So what I discovered is if you want to manually adjust the keyboard brightness, you have to reprogram the alt key in settings to alt, to make its function be alt. And then sure enough, once you do that, alt and then the brightness keys will adjust the keyboard brightness. But here's the other thing. When you do adjust the brightness or the keyboard brightness, it disables the ambient light sensors. So if I turn the keyboard backlight on during the evening and then I put the computer to sleep and I just go to bed and I wake up the next morning and it's bright, the keyboard backlight is still on. And that's really annoying because the keys are gray and the backlight is white. And in the daytime, if the backlight is on, you pretty much can't read the keys. Pretty much every computer out there. You can turn the brightness up manually if you want, but eventually, if you like put the computer to sleep and open it again, or if it gets super dark in the room, the ambient sensors will adjust the brightness accordingly. And then if they adjust it and you don't like it, you just set it back, right? That's how every other computer works. But for some reason, Google thinks that when you adjust the brightness, that you always want it to be that brightness until you turn the thing off and then turn it back on again. I don't understand that. Those two things are the biggest pet peeves that I have developed with this machine. That and the speakers actually are the most annoying things. Other than that, I've so far enjoyed this thing. I'll come back after the full week and we'll give my final thoughts on the Google Pixel Book and my Switch. So at this point, I've spent a full week using the Google Pixel Book as my only laptop and it's been more doable than I thought it would be. Obviously, with Chrome OS, you have to make some sacrifices. A quick bout of video editing was not gonna happen, nor was a photo retouching in Photoshop. On that subject though, Chrome OS now has access to the Play Store and all of the apps that go with it, so the Photoshop app is included. This drastically increases the utility of the Chromebook because it is essentially an Android tablet as well. However, that also means that it is as limited as an Android tablet in terms of what apps you can get for it. There's also a local file system that you can now access, although again, it's somewhat limited. Chrome OS used to be Google Chrome with a desktop background, but it's come a long way in the last six or seven years. That being said, it still feels less useful than Windows or Mac OS. Maybe it's just because I've used those OS's a lot and relied on them, but I still feel limited by Chrome OS. As for the Pixelbook itself, aside from the speakers, the weird bendy construction, and frustrating ambient light sensors, I do like this device. The hardware is undeniably stylish and it feels very high quality. I think for most people, this device is unnecessary. You really don't need these specs to run Chrome OS. Chrome OS was sort of set up to be a stripped down budget operating system, but everything about this Pixelbook is premium. You really don't need a Core i7, half terabyte SSD, and 16 gigabytes of RAM for Chrome OS. It's unnecessary. But at the same time, I don't think Google was trying to make a Chromebook for the masses here. They know that this is a premium device and that it has to be appreciated for what it is. It's not really a next generation Chromebook, it's just an expensive one. As far as whether I think the Google Pixelbook is worth it, it really depends on how much you're willing to spend for a Chromebook. It's a really nice device and I really enjoy using it, but I don't know if I could justify spending $1,600 on it. Then again, people say the exact same stuff about MacBooks and I find MacBooks to be very usable, so it really depends on where you're coming from and what you want from your device. So that'll do it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. As usual, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter, at LukeMiani, and I'll see you all in the next video.